Welcome to What is Next. What is Next is a very educative program on GTV, the authentic and trusted voice of Ghana. What is Next seeks to raise questions about contemporary challenges confronting us as a people. But in the process, we look for people we consider to be people with accumulated wisdom people who are thought leaders of our country at the moment and we get closer to them and allow them to use the grace God has given to them the wisdom the inside experiences they have to help us uh, find relevant answers to such questions confronting us and just by God's grace today on what is next my guest uh, comes with different paths, a man with many paths. He is a former chief of staff, uh, then Castle some years ago, but he is also a senior consultant of um, the United Nations, especially when it comes to matters of uh, political transition. He is also uh, a pejahine of Gomua, uh, a Jumako traditional area in the central region and he is also a Christian a member a proud member of the Tema Joint Church I'm talking about Nana Ato Dazi Nana welcome to what is next Thank you, I would have loved to Thank shake you, hands but because of As the current we, yeah. challenge but uh, uh, we are happy you've made time to be with us on what is next. Uh, for some of my viewers, you, they are, you are known, yes, as a lawyer who once upon a time was uh, <laughs> battling some issue at the Supreme Court. Others, you are known as a former chief of staff. But help my viewers to know a little bit about you. Who is Nana Atodazi? Well, thank you very much, uh, Sofa. Thank you to your, the numerous viewers, listeners. Um, basically, now to that is just me sitting out here. Uh, I step out there and people say that I have, probably have a name that is bigger and taller than me. <laughs> uh, but um, I schooled at Adisada College. It is a very important uh, landmark to mention um, because of the kind of training we're giving out there uh, to the mind, heart, and hands. From Adisada College, I went through sixth form at um, Sekini College two years, there was in the University of Ghana, and also a proud member of Commonwealth Hall. You can understand, you know, <laughs> eventually I had to stand in and do a case to um, keep Commonwealth Hall uh, surviving as a male uh, hall. It was quite interesting. Um, I also worked briefly with uh, State Insurance Corporation as a solicitor and um, then went into private practice. It's a very challenging period in the late 70s and 80s. Um, called into government on radio, you know, in those days, you don't have to lobby. You just look out and point out. And then, uh, so I became a regional minister, the equivalent of a regional minister for Central Region, actually, for a brief period. And I had to uh, move to the castle of Usu, in, yes, also in 1983, uh, to literally serve as secretary to the then government, the PNDC. Uh, rose through, became a special assistant to the president, or the chairman, later the president, later on uh, became the chief of staff. Um, 19 years on, in government, straight, you know, servicing government, uh, our government was booted out, and um, I went back to what uh, was my first love, that is law practice. And um, I've been in there, uh, running into something like 44 years uh, at the bar, you know, so 
I think I've seen it quite a bit of it. Yeah, yes, Nana, you, when you mention a disadol, you talk about the kind of nurturing that you receive and you said that is very important. What were some of the values growing up, uh, values that have stayed with you in your professional work? Uh, what are the values that values you don't want to disconnect with? Oh, certainly, um, yeah, I decided students are very, 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 very proud, no matter where the, the levels they attain, uh, they still want to remember their past. With a very strong old boy system, um, it's because of what um, we, we grew up to be, you know, um, we're taught to use our hands. I mean, nothing is dirty for us to work with. We were taught to study hard, work hard, and pray hard. And the conclusion from our you know, school ode, you know, is that if you work hard and uh, pray hard and you play hard, you will, either be, you will be either the first or with the first. And I believe that one. It's almost an article of faith. That um, it, 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 Essentially, it's, it's like some sense of um, uh, moral education is important for our uh, uh, youth. Uh, it's a, it will be a shame if you don't believe in anything at all. You, at least you must believe in something. You know, and, uh, for us, uh, we were made to believe that this world was, uh, was created by somebody, you know, and, um, or a being. And um, as a result, we are subject to you know, the dictates of uh, this, this, this being. And, uh, we are very, very, very proud of our training. Um, morality in, in public life is also very critical. Um, if you don't have the moral training, there will be no limits to what you do. You know, you can mention it. Uh, do anything and think you can get away with it. But for us, yeah, by training, you, you understand that there will be consequences to every action of yours. And I think that it, 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 it's helped us, mold us into what we are today. Yeah, Nana. Uh, you know, people like you who have been on top of your career as a traditional leader, as a you know, public uh, uh, servant in law, are there one or two people that you publicly want to go and even affirm them, say thank you to them because of maybe the influence they have on you? We are all looking for mentors, but the mentors also themselves may have their own mentors. Oh, yeah, so, certainly, certainly. Uh, I've gone through uh, so many hands, but um, in terms of my legal training, you know, mentoring. Um, I do remember uh, the first person I walked into, whose chambers I literally took over when he was in uh, uh, preventive uh, detention. That is um, uh, Mr. Brody Mens. Uh, he was um, the PP, the minister there. But he was one kind of a person very forthright. I mean, he knew you always draw the line between truth and falsehood. You always draw the line. And he was a very strong, passionate believer in what is right. And he wouldn't hesitate to tell you in the face, no matter who you are, from the president right down, that this is not right. And that's the kind of person, you know, I mean, I worked into his uh, chambers. Uh, when he was released, he came back. I said, I want to go back to state insurance. He said, don't waste my time. Just go back. You earn more here than out there. <laughs> so I stayed in there, and uh, we worked. He gave me the opportunity to um, do cases at a time when some of my classmates had never been to the high court or the court of appeal. So kind of got a bit of a head start yeah, in law practice. Um, also, we, uh, I want to mention uh, a personal friend, Dave Hall. I don't know whether you ever met him. He was uh, 
navigators, you know, the mm -hmm. navigators here, coordinator in Ghana, and um, we uh, happen to have been one of the first coach disciples he adopted, and over a long period, we've had we had a very great relationship, uh, almost a family thing, and um, uh, he took me through the book of uh, Samuel Kings, and just when we finished. Christian, or for that matter, anybody who wants to go into public life must read those books. First Samuel, Second Samuel, First Kings, you know. Because no matter how you look at it, whether it's a religious thing or what, you see how, you know, people go through various challenges, you know, uh, particularly in terms of kinship, leadership, and other things. And I think really grateful to Dave for you know, for this. I also went through uh, the hands of Mr. Joe Randolph, who became uh, an attorney general in this country. Uh, I was in his chambers uh, briefly, but I, it was also one of the guys I really respected, respected. And I learned a lot that you can reach the highest level in your profession, or at least in the legal profession, if you maintain that high standard you know, ethical standard, and uh, it's not really the money so much, but you must also have a heart, a passion for people. We do a lot of cases pro bono. Viewers, this is what is next on GTV, the authentic and trusted voice of Ghana. And I'm in conversation with Nana Ato Dazi. Nana, you are very familiar with uh, politics in Ghana. Is is there anything that we can identify and name political hooliganism? Yes, yes. Um, political hooliganism is 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 for real, for real. Um, it's not new. As a phenomenon, it's not new, except that of late, it's it's uh, heightened. You know, it's increased. It's on the ascendancy, uh, but um, in the in the in the in the late forties, during the late uh, colonial um, 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 era, we had you know uh, people who were uh, put together to cause mayhem as and when, you know, both from the uh, the position of the colonial masters as well as the we. Who were on the other side, the receiving it then. In the, we call them Russians, basically. People <laughs> get Russians, they know, they know what to do. In the post or middle uh, uh, period before independence, um, there was a lot of agitation. And uh, people exercised dissent, to show their dissent in, in various ways. Um, not if, if I disagreed or we disagree with the position, either with UGCC or CPP, uh, they found ways of exercising this through such acti activities like hooliganism and whatnot. That basically, the dictionary definition of hooliganism just uh, uh, just a deliberate, you know, intentional, organized, you know, acts of destruction and um, causing mayhem. You know, just for a purpose, in this case for political ends, you know, so it can be identified as and, and, and Is there a difference between political uh, 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 um, violence and criminal violence? I don't want to recognize one. I don't want to recognize one. Like I'm saying, I mean, uh, I remember the AU Political uh, Bureau, you know, last year after the uh, Iowa so West Wogan, they issued a statement advising Ghana and the, the people, the government, that we should not, you know, politicize security, no securitize politics. You understand? And uh, I, I find it quite fascinating. Uh, fascinating. It's just a question of 
throwing your names about. You understand? Violence is violence. Under our uh, Criminal Offenses Act, you know, the criminal code then, uh, violence, uh, there's nothing like political violence. Get me? It's just a one of giving it a name. You understand? If, um, and if an MP, for instance, just example, goes into a, a registration center, you know, and discharges, uh, what do you call it, a firearm in public, it's a crime, period. I mean, there's nothing you can say about that. Was it political? No, that's nothing like political discharging. There's no politics in the bullets, you know. <laughs> you understand? Aha. Uh -huh. That's the kind of situation that we, we're talking about. However, I will be quick to, uh, to add that, you see, political hooliganism, it's a very interesting phenomenon which, if you don't check, quickly develops a certain subculture of its own with rules and regulations and whatnot outside the mainstream of the legal process. You understand? It's a very dangerous situation. People put in money, people earn money, so it becomes, you know, uh, what do you call it, um, a mercenary thing. Governments support, I mean, I say governments support uh, uh, such persons or such violence. You know, some are pure mercenaries. I say there are people who are just uh, like landguards. You pay them, they go and do your dirty job for you. You understand? So it's either they are supported or they, they're just pure mercenary, or in some cases, they are actually created by establishments. And they say they are uh, political violence. I think as we go on, we can, uh, we can delve into it a bit, but uh, definitely, as I said, for me, violence is violence, and that is what we must deal with. And is there a point that political violence can be part of our democratic process? Is Absolutely there, not. We should never encourage it. We should never, never, never encourage political violence. As I said, I don't recognize anything called political violence. Violence must be treated clean. We shouldn't have we treat uh, political violence with cape gloves because you come to swallow all of us, including swallow those who created it, who would have created it. Indeed, if you go into political history, you find out that is it uh, about 4 BC or so, Augustus, you know, uh, was emperor. At the time, they used to create this uh, mercenary force, you know, their uh, service force. Uh, militia of first type and they follow them and what not. You know what they do? They were the ones who were, after some time, they realized they had sufficient power and strength and arms. <laughs> you got me? You, 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 they follow you. They were the ones who were eliminating the emperors and what not. Do you see what we talking about? So they destroy you. At a point in time, they became so powerful that they decided to, you know, uh, what do you call it? Uh, they, to detect who should be emperor. We have uh, uh, symptoms of it, even in Ghana. People are appointed to positions in this country and other, you know, um, organizations, you know, say, no, this guy didn't help. He wasn't part of us. They pulled the guy, you know, we have uh, incidents in Kumasi. They pull the guy bloody, you know, bloody. They won't allow you. That is what it is. That is the danger of it. You cannot combine the two. You should never combine the two. It's a dangerous, you know, uh, phenomenon. Mm -hmm. and, and you mentioned the 1940s towards independence. And I'm asking that um, this political hooliganism in our political dispensation, is it uh, a legacy from our colonial and military past? Is it a management of our democracy? Is it as a result of weak institutions? Or is it even our cultural practices? Well, well, um, I think the, the colonial mass has been gone for some time. And uh, we should start to accept our weaknesses. Uh, they, like, like I said, I mean, we have ourselves uh, followed, we, is a, part of it was a reaction to the, uh, the uh, dominance, you know, uh, 
uh, by the colonial masses and all that, yes. But it was marginal. Then the, 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 the pre-independence, uh, pre as I said, that was uh, a really standoff between the, like the NLM and CPP and whatnot. Um, we come into the, um, the First Republic. Uh, yes, we, we, we saw some of them, some of it, uh, that stuff. The Second Republic, it's also staying the Third Republic. It's been on, it's been on. Generally, when it comes to uh, democratic um, elections and whatnot, you know, it is because, for some people, it's because the, the window of participation in democratic process is almost like being shut. So they think that the answer is to, as it were, yank the door wider open to assert themselves that we must be service. So it, it's a challenge to our system. But I must confess that uh, there's almost a unanimous uh, verdict out there that uh, this phenomenon in this fourth republic, particularly within the last three, four years, is on the ascendancy. Uh, uh, this, is, this has been, you know... I don't know what, what is fuller in it? What was, if, if it's, it's, it's on the ascendancy, what is fuller in the political hooliganism we are witnessing? One word. Impunity. It's as simple as that. You see, impunity is the thing that fuels it right away. Go. If, if if any person, NDC, MPP, CPP, commits a crime of any kind, any violence, and you don't look at it as a, a, what do you call it, a, a political violence, and that must not be touched. A, you put him through the, the, the what do you call it, the law. There can't be any problem. Oh, this will stop. This will stop. But you see, it is being driven by people who want to achieve and sustain power. You understand? There will be no these, uh, pol uh, political hooligans around if they are not, you know, um, what do you call it, fueled by... Uh, re some resources and whatnot. Some some party members also take it upon themselves to create this kind of force or group, you know, with the purpose to gain more leverage or weight within their own political parties. You get me? So, for, but for the leadership, you know, all, all political leadership is basically you need a, a little uh, ways and means, you know, to support you. You get me? But it is also a reflection on the fact that we are by that saying that we have weak or less than strong you know, institutions. And I'll come back to the institution, but I would like you to look straight into this camera. Yes. And you said that what is fueling political hooliganism in Ghana and it's in an ascendancy, it's impunity. Absolutely. Kindly talk to somebody who is watching us, especially you mentioned leaders. Yes, yes. yes. That uh, we, we can uh, continue traveling with this impunity. Just, we may not know who is watching. Well, uh, I'm saying, I mean, uh, we are in dangerous times. We have had leaders. Um, um, Police leaders, Kuvubachi and all this, oh, they've said that 2020 is a dangerous period for us if we don't deal with the issue of impunity. The president has said that he will not encourage impunity. Law and order, you know, must be maintained. The police, IGPs, and what everybody said it. Last year, we had, was it last year or so, we had um, the, the painful situation of Ayawa so West. We'd never seen it you know, hooliganism in this proportion. But it did happen. We thought, oh, Ghana is a peaceful place. But it did happen. But the point about it is that we came to a conclusion that never again should such a thing happen. The president said it. Parliament said it. We passed a law. We actually, you know, increase and enhance punishment. 10 years, 15 years, 25 years for political hooliganism. Call it vigilantism. We said we were all satisfied. It will never happen again. No, no, no. It can't happen. 
But everybody else is shocked. Like you say, Banda, you know, is a teacher trainee. He's been stabbed. Out there, guns are being thrown out. What is the future for the next five months? I think that the leaders, our leaders, must not only be saying it, we must show greater commitment to stamping out, you know, political vigilantism or political hooliganism. If they wouldn't help us, it would dent the image of this country. We are already way down there, but it will worsen the situation for us, you know, in terms of image. I mean, I'm not yet ready to go into that area, but um, the, the history is, is, is horrible. Left, right, you know, Togo, Nigeria, um, um, Ivory Coast, you know, Ivory Coast lost 3,000 people in that, in their, their, this kind of situation. Togo has been ongoing. Nigeria lost 3 million in the in in Civil War. You understand? Rwanda lost 800 to 1 million people in three months. Killed through political vigilantism. Go to East Congo. It's, it's, it's a horrible situation. Some countries have even disappeared from the face of the of the of the of, of the of the earth. In terms of look, look at Somalia. Where is Somalia now? Just a warlord. The Somalia that we we knew about when we grew, we were growing up. Sorry, you know. Yeah, they are gone. You know, uh, Libya until recently is a great ally. What's happened? So I think that we should take a cue from it. For us in Ghana, we, the least we can do is to go to Budumburam and see that Budumburam is a living testimony of what vigilantism, you know, can do. I went to Liberia and you know, read stories and saw people. I was amazed. I went to Sierra Leone. We landed, and not less than fifty people, all with arms, chopped. I asked, "What? Well, these are victims of our our, our war, dirty war." You understand? It's, it's, it's harrowing. So I think that it shouldn't say it cannot happen in Ghana. We better stop it. The leaders have a greater task to pull our people up. And if people commit a crime and we do not have them punished, then we are encouraging them to do it. Viewers, this is what is next. And I'm in conversation with Nana Ato Dazi, a former chief of staff of this country and also a senior consultant of the United Nations when it comes to a matter of democratic transition. And he is saying that the impunity associated with political hooliganism in Ghana must stop. And picking his word, he said that leaders must pull their people out is asking the various leaders to pull your people out of political hooliganism. Nana, sometimes I hear that Ghanaians are peaceful, peace-loving, but we also have evidence of violence, that we can also be violent. Who are we? Are we peace-loving or bloodthirsty people? No, 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 no. There's nothing strange about us. We are just uh, standard human beings. I was in Sierra Leone. Just to talk about I mean, I was in Sierra Leone some years back before the, the, the Getty War and, uh, with uh, some Anglican bishops. I used to be a chancellor of the Anglican Church uh, Central Region. So, a group of us. And one of the things that amazed me was uh, on Sundays you would see people walking to the cemeteries. Sisters, you know, who have been married with food and fruits and whatnot. I was, I was, I was, I was uh, thrilled by it. A decade or more later, I went to Sierra Leone, uh, just driving around. I was shocked. Not only were there hotels, you know, with pork bags and uh, bullets and whatnot. The cemeteries, even the grave, dead, dead people. People are, they, they, they just shot at, they, I don't know what was happening in the, the graves or what, no, there was a war there, all destroyed. They are, and, and, and as I said, you I mean at the cemetery? Yeah, the graves themselves have been fired, I don't know whether some of them fighting and, or some of the rebels were hiding there. So, but, but the point I'm making is that I saw the Sierra Leoneans, peace loving people. And I saw them later 
I said, I felt so sad. I'm saying that we can trip. And that's what's dangerous. These things you can trip. Ivory Coast started with just a few issues of, oh, he's not an Ivorian. Oh, he's an Ivorian. He's not an Ivorian. That kind of thing. It gets me. Before we could say Jack, like I said, 50,000 people displaced, 3,000 or so people dead. Nigeria started, he's a Nigerian, he's oh, he's a, um, you are no greater Niger and all that. Before we could say Jack, it trip, it always starts this way. That is what is dangerous. There's no watershed, you can, there's no line you can say from this point on, you know, it's going to start. So we can pull back. It just trips. So, we are peace loving, very, very, very peace loving. But we can do some awful things to ourselves as human beings. You know what it is to, is it, is it Major Mahama or that? You will never believe that Ghanaians can go reach that level. That is such a moment of madness. And this whole country can be in flame. Let's no joke with ourselves. And Nana, normally it's. When it comes to political hooliganism, it's like religious leaders who come out to condemn it, civil society groups. But you don't hear political leaders condemning their own. You said earlier on that they must pull out their own. But you don't hear them condemning even when their own people are involved in such. Well, well there's a contradiction is there. I mean, it's quite clear. I mean, um, the guys who go down there to do the dirty job, let me put it that way, for want of a better dirty job. You know, do it for the leaders. Or oh, for the common good. You get me? So how do you go back turn around and go and condemn them? You see, so it's 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 a very difficult situation. Politics is also about numbers, as we all know. We need more persons. So, so how do you go and throw out your 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 your, your own? Particularly those who will stand up and fight for you or ready to go out and defend the establishment. You get me? It, it is a very uh, difficult thing. But if we are talking about democracy, political, democratic ethos, you know, uh, uh, throws out certain uh, issues in relief. You understand? We talk about democracy. We talk about, you know, people, jaw jaw, talking, getting some consultation together, you know, and um, agreeing on issues. Yes, it's, not, no, it's not like when I'm talking, you are using a gun or machete or what not. Then we, we, we can't. Then I have to uh, lift my act a little up. There is an impression out there that the leadership in our political parties have failed to approve political violence or hooliganism. In some cases, they actually seem to encourage and find it by inflammatory speeches. Would that be a fair assessment? Oh, it should not be too far from the, from the truth. Um, um, a lot of times you see people, uh, political leaders, you know, across the board, you know, as it were, you know, uh, you know quietly encouraging people looking elsewhere, you know. And I'm saying of late, it, it's been the worrying signs have been there, you get me? You have, there are certain things which responsible political leaders ought not to go public to say. You cross the line. You cross the line. When you start talking about some people not being Guineans, you cross the line. You understand? You are, you are, if people are not Ghanaians, <laughs> there are processes that we go through to identify them, to have them flush out. You understand? It, it, there are certain things that we, we unconsciously do which will create bigger problems for us. And, may pray, 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 and, and I, I'm happy you talk about uh, the, uh, the religious leaders and whatnot. I won't go full. Uh, in length with you, you know, the, all the way you are suffering. I'm sorry to say this, but but no, no quite a sizable number of our Christian leaders oh, are suffering too. They are fueling it. They are creating part of it. When you come out with prophecies, someone will die, someone will have an accident, this political, it's, 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 it's harrowing. It's not the word of God. What does this one come from? 
Now they seem to be predicting, you know, or they, they are king makers. Look at me. They should be looking at people who are going to suffer as a result of, you know, the political uh, violence. Some of the, uh, so for the priests and the churches, the leaders, they themselves work with a phalanx of, uh, what do you call it, uh, armed, you know, persons. All kinds of pieces and whatnot, you know, thick muzzles and whatnot. Ah! Jesus walked how many? Ah, maybe he had 12. 12. <laughs> I don't know. I always don't want to cross the line. You know I mean? So, so I, I think that it's, 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 a, it's a national challenge. I would rather put it that way. That all of us have an obligation to deal with it. And the worst form of compounding this kind of crime is by being silent. Oh. Okay. You know, I, I, I almost wanted to mention a very controversial issue, you know. Uh, you are on the eminent advisory body. Sorry. Anyway. I don't, I don't, you don't want us to go there. I will go there. Let's get our priests that who are dominated yeah. out there to also, so, what do you call it? All of us come out and then, you know, we'll make a lot. And I will go there. The issue of Call peace. That, that silence cannot be an option. Oh, no, absolutely. In the midst of political hooliganism, silent, whether from traditional leaders, whether from religious leaders, silent cannot be an option. But do the various political parties have enough ethics and discipline, you know, in terms of mentoring, nurturing younger uh, 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 ones who are coming? You know, because sometimes it's like the more you can go out and attack and insult, you know, then space is created for you. And, and you don't see, you keep talking about the lines. Yes. You say, where is ethics? Where is discipline? Who is in charge of it? And you are a seasoned politician. You understand the political terrain. Per where you are standing, do the various political parties have enough ethics and discipline for uh, uh, the challenge of political hooliganism, Nana? Well, um, I, I think that almost all the political parties have internal disciplinary you know, <clears throat> uh, mechanisms built into them, the rules and regulations. Um, secondly, the, the, the national constitution, 1992, clearly indicates that the uh, <clears throat> The political parties must be run on democratic lines, <laughs> you know, use regulations and whatnot. But like I said earlier on, it's such a very difficult situation. The, the leaders work on very, you know, a thin line, you know, when it comes to discipline. You need these errant, so-called errant chaps. Until somebody comes to uh, tell you that he's up to this, you get me, and that what he's doing is in, 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 in favor of the, the party. Massive corruption. You hurt me. I say, look, but this guy is using it for the party. Where do, you, where do you stand? How do you pull the person back? Or he commits a crime. Murder. Plain murder. He stabbed somebody. You know, I think that, like I'm saying, what we probably need to do is so disenable that subculture you know that develops around political parties in circumstances that they are not subject to the existing laws of the country you know that should be disabled mm. so that the laws of the country have a full and firm control over political uh, parties you understand there, there's no reason why we, uh, we they should have a different uh, you know, uh, what do you call it, set of rules applying uh, 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 to them. But of course, all this must be within a certain institution. Do we have institutions strong enough to contain, you know, these mm -hmm. uh, overly powerful establishments? Mm -hmm. Viewers, this is what is next on GTV, the authentic and trusted voice of Ghana. And I'm in conversation with Nana Ato Dazi, a former chief of staff of this country, this republic, and Apeja Hine, in his uh, traditional area. And he is saying that we must disengage these 
kind of subculture, political hooliganism, that kind of culture we are building around our democracy. But Nana, what is it fair to say that the history of prosecution or political hooliganism has also sustained the practice? Oh yes, but that, that's exactly so that's exactly the point I made. Is that you see the history of prosecution is a I like it's a very nice way of putting <laughs> the problem. Uh, the history of the prosecution is one of no prosecution. You understand? This is the, that is our history. That we don't prosecute. That's what I'm saying. And that leads to impunity. And that's where the problem is. When it comes to possibly prosecuting, we are more eager to prosecute the other side. You know, at any time there's a government, you know, it's more of the other side than us, as it were. You know, but I'm saying that, like I said, they use our choke. We must disengage that subculture. You get me? The national uh, uh, justice, criminal uh, justice system must operate and we must support it we must we must uh, uh, put a little more money into it you know training and whatnot and uh, enable our policemen you know our security service guys to feel that they can act without having to look back or look over their shoulder who's watching we have some of the best you know policemen and military personnel who've gone out of this country and distinguish themselves. Battalions, they go, they distinguish themselves, they come back here, they can't arrest, you know, somebody who's committed a crime in no time. It's, it's amazing. Yesterday or two days ago, I heard uh, Mr. Kokubaku, you know, pleading that for once they should arrest the guy who stabbed, whoever stabbed the band. Why should it take, you know, you know, a journalist? to call on police to do what they have to do anyway, they would like to do. That's the kind of thing. They must be, you shouldn't even say that proactive. They must just do simply do what they are paid to do. Why are they unable to do what they are able to do? You see, you have to listen to some of the statements put out by policemen. And put out by, you know, published. That the politicians invariably, you know, you know, weigh on them so heavily that for them the best option is to move into a neutral mode. Mm. Don't do anything. So they are standing there, and the people are, you know, uh, what they call it, vigilantes. Uh, you know, beating people up, harassing people, and nobody says anything. The policeman is standing there, looking elsewhere. And, and, and I, you are a lawyer, you are a former. Uh, regional president, chairman of Ghana Bar Association, yeah, Central yeah, Region. Yeah. And why is it that Ghanaians will send matters of theft, uh, fraud to, to court, but political issues, it's like they don't feel the place to go is the police station, but they should rather, you know, turn this hooligan, uh, violent approach. Why, why yeah, is yeah, it? Well, but that's the point I'm making. I'm saying that there's a, there's, there's a subculture that has developed that we've all fallen in, they, they've succeeded in putting, trapping all of us into believing that crimes committed under the rubric of politics, you get me, cannot be tried in the regular courts. If you are a judge and you are sitting and uh, you know, political, so violence issues is brought to you and people storm your court, they storm your court. To attack you yourself. You want to take the next case of political violence? I mean, just we must stop. We must put the brakes on. Political violence is no good for the health of this country. And, 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 uh, strong societies are known by strong institutions. It seems our institutions are not strong enough to handle political hooliganism in Ghana at the moment with what you are telling me. Yes, yes. Uh, I think that the, what, yeah, uh, uh, that the conclusion is obviously yes. I think that what we need is a greater collaboration between the, the uh, executive legislature and judiciary and then the agencies. Definitely. 
for us to decide that we pull back. We will let the law enforcement agencies do their work. You see, in some other societies, what they do is that they build, you know, some arrangements, some conventions, some what law into it, some laws actually into it that make it equally an offense, grievous offense for an executive, you know, a political character, or a leader to try and interfere in the work of the police, for instance. I mean, the worst thing you can do in, in the UK or the US, even not even the president of America would dare, as it were, you know, touch a district attorney who is investigating a case, or handling a case. But Nana, let me ask this question. People like you, I mean, uh, we may have Letter Day Saints in, say, NDC, but some of you have been there when the baby was born. Do we have such high level advisory, not necessarily partisan, but people that now our various political party, the, the latter say they, saints, must consciously listen to? Because it's like we have the men, we have, you know, father figures, but when we find ourselves in the midst of the storm, either they are now you talk about silence earlier on and that's where i'm going either we don't see them or for some reason we are not ready for them so not that they don't have the answers but their voices are not being heard yeah uh, i th i think that uh, I, i'm saying this because our pastors are, are suffering it yes. the attacks the you know and all that so some have been forced into silence the yeah. silence you mentioned yeah. and even there are political people like you I don't know, but who may also be forced into silence? You see, but we have the people, but the voices are not being heard. Yes, then then we have a weak democracy. I mean, that's, I'm sorry, I to, because the, one of the democratic terms, one of the key things is um, the right to speak and um, not feel that somebody will come and hit you in the head. You know, immediately you finish speaking, or in the night, come and knock at your door and what not. You must develop a deeper sense of uh, responsibility to stand up and say no. I think that the window, um, or at least the door for a democratic uh, expression, is closing up a little. And um, we, 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 we must do something. Now, how do we get our young people to claim their genuine political space? In the electoral process and refuse to be used as mere tools of uh, 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 violence by politicians. How do we save and protect our young people? That 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 that, that, that is um, uh, a deep one. But um, I think that you see the I think it's Article thirty five nine or so of the Constitution talks about the need for the state to um, encourage principles of tolerance. So we should go back and start teaching people in class one and what not, what tolerance means. Because it's at the, at the base of this the democratic process that you, you let people express their views. They just even express their dissent. And in 30 seconds, your last word to my viewers. Well, I think that... <laughs> well, um, I think that we are in challenging times. I still believe I have absolute faith in Ghana. I know that with a little bit of effort, we will come back to see that it is a beautiful process to have people act, people dissent, and we still move on. This country will move on. This country will move on, and this country must move on. Viewers, this is what is next on GTV, the authentic and trusted voice of Ghana. And I've been in conversation with Nana Atodazi, a, a former chief of staff at the then castle, and also a senior consultant at the United Nations on uh, democratic uh, transitions. And we've been discussing political hooliganism. My name is Kwabuna Opuni from Pong. I'll come your way same time next week. Till then, may God bless our homeland Ghana. Make this dear nation of ours great and strong.